My name is Jake, welcome to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna go over Vanguard's economic and market outlook for 2024. If you remember a year ago, I made a similar video reviewing Vanguard's economic and market outlook for 2023. And I'm gonna share at the beginning of this video, kind of a brief recap of what Vanguard got right and what they got wrong in their last year's report. And then we're gonna take a look at their report here for 2024. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna share my thoughts and opinions on investing here in 2024 based off of what we learned here from Vanguard, as well as just kind of looking at where the market is and just kind of want to share my personal thoughts and how I'm viewing this. And if you're new to the channel, once again, my name is Jake. I retired at the age of 37 here last year from my nine to five job. I reached what is called barista fire. That means I'm working part time, but I'm also living off of my dividend portfolio. My dividend portfolio is what you're seeing here on your screen. This is my M1 portfolio. So I mostly talk about dividend growth investing as well as the fire movement, financial independence from retire early and living off of your dividend portfolio. And if you are new to the channel, one thing that you'll notice about my content is I don't create YouTube videos really to make money. Yes, I generate a little bit of income and it definitely does help, but it's not my sole purpose of creating YouTube videos. I cr I've been creating videos for four and a half years and I just genuinely really, really enjoy it. I'm just a dividend nerd like that. I just really, really like it. And if you've watched a handful of my videos, you probably can see that, that my content is very different than many others and I pride myself on that. I don't wanna be like everybody else. I wanna be my own personality and and there's going to be some of you out there that don't really like that. And there's going to be some of you that really, you know, kind of connect with that. And so I really pride myself on being authentic, being real and sharing the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that comes with really trying to live off of a you know, a dividend portfolio like I talk about on the channel. All right, well anyways, here, before we dive into the video, I just wanted to share something with you that I spent a lot of time and, and effort and love in making this. Uh, I prepared a brief documentary since it's the beginning of 2024, we're gonna start with a bang, that I wanted to share with all of you. And it looks a little like this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh man. Oh, I love it. I love it. I had to put a lot of effort and love into that. Um, it took me a handful of hours to get that finally approved so that YouTube wouldn't copyright it. Uh, so I had to change it up quite a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, watching it as much as I, I enjoyed making it. Anyway, so let's take a look at this. So this is Vanguard's economic and market report for last year for 2023. And I just want to briefly kind of take a look and see what they got right and what they got wrong. So in their forecast, they do economic forecasts and really just to a you know snapshot here, they were projecting that GDP growth in the US would be pretty flat at 0.25%. They were way off. I think the entire market was off with this one. No one expected that the uh, the market was that you know GDP would grow so fast here in 2023. Um, so they were way off with that forecast. When it comes to unemployment, they were also way off. They were off by one and a half percent. They were off by over three. What is it like three or three to five million something like that uh, when it comes to the the unemployment. So. 
Uh, they, they were off on that one. In terms of headline inflation, they did get very, very close. I think in November, it came in at 3.1%. We don't have, uh, in the making of this video, we don't have the December yet, but it came in at 3.1, so they hit that one pretty well. Monetary policy, they came very, very close at 5%. I think we were at like five and a quarter to five and a half. So they came in very, very close with those. So they got a, they got a, a pretty good, they got about a, a B plus in my book when it comes to this, if I were to grade them. But where they came up really short, and this is not just unique to, to Vanguard, if you were to watch any economist, anyone talking about financial markets at the end of 2022, going into 2023, everyone was saying that we were going to go into a recession and Vanguard was not alone. They predicted or projected that there was a 90% probability that the U.S. would enter a recession in 2023. OK, and so this is just the data. This is what you know, you can do with it what you want. But even the almighty Vanguard, they get it wrong sometimes. Not everybody gets it right. It, it also doesn't necessarily help that we ch kind of change the definition of what a recession is. If you guys remember that, I always thought that, that was kind of funny and odd that we're changing definitions or or bringing back old definitions that were never really accounted for until all of a sudden it was a, it was a weird time. Let's just leave it at that. But yeah, that was their forecast. And so overall, their their outlook and predictions here for last year, I give them about a, a C grade. So that's the brief recap on 2023. All right, now let's take a look at their forecast for 2024. Now, I read this entire document. I think that only about half of it is worth sharing here on YouTube. If you're an absolute nerd, you should go and, and read this whole report. It's it's kind of interesting. A lot of it is it's kind of repetitive because what you'll notice, and just to kind of throw it out there from the beginning, there's a lot of talk about rates. <laughs> and I mean, it's kind of no wonder that the rate topic has, you know, monetary policy has dominated the headlines for, for the last you know, a year or so. So let's take a look at this. I highlighted the areas that I think were most interesting, and I'm going to read off a few of them and share some of my commentary and thoughts on some of this. So uh, first off, when looking at, at 2024, we're here and, you know, Vanguard saying that this transition to a higher interest rate environment has no doubt challenged investors. And I think we can all agree with that, who've endured historical losses in bonds and high volatility in stocks. A fun fact, I think in 2022 was the worst year ever for the 60-40 portfolio. Okay, so 60% stocks, 40% bonds. So really, really horrible volatility and and loss in, in value. And it's just, it was a really, really difficult year for investors across the board. So then moving on here, this structural shift, talking about kind of the interest rate environment, uh, which will endure beyond the next business cycle, is the single best economic and financial development in the last 20 years. I find the word best kind of interesting how they would use that word. So this time has been really difficult, especially if you're a millennial, we've not experienced anything like that in our lifetimes. And it's possible, you know, when we think about probabilities, it's possible that we never experience it again. But who knows? It's just, that's how profound this event has been that it's like a once in a lifetime, once in a generation type of thing. And so that's why it's such a big deal. And so the really the emphasis of this article or this report is that there's a return to sound money. So what is sound money? Sound money is more kind of like your real return um, adjusted for inflation, okay? And so sound money, the persistence of a positive real interest rate provides a solid foundation for long-term risk adjusted returns. In contrast to the last decade, we expect return outcomes for diversified investors to be more balanced. For those with an appropriate risk tolerance, a more defensive risk posture may make sense given higher expected fixed income returns and an equity market and to fully reflect the implications of the return to sound money. So this is talking about you know, risk adjusted returns. And I'm gonna to get to that in a moment here towards the end, but they do a comparison of the projected returns, risk adjusted returns based off of volatility, investing into bonds versus equities. And you may actually get into spoiler, you may actually get a similar return with more of a fixed income approach over the next 10 years versus an equity approach with less 
volatility. So that's kind of a, a teaser to what's to come in this report, but that's what they're hinting towards here in the, uh, the introduction of this report. So now let's take a look at their forecast for 2024. So like 2023, um, they're forecasting very low GDP growth here in the United States. And if you're outside of the US, you can see here the other areas um, that they're, they're forecasting. And then within unemployment here in the US, they're forecasting a one to one and a half percent increase in unemployment. That would mean between about three and five million people would lose their jobs. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they were pretty off last year. Doesn't mean they're gonna be off again, but that's significant. That means three to five million people may lose their job here in 2024. So something to keep an eye on. One bit of good news is that they're saying that core inflation is gonna get down to 2.3% by the year end. Now, this is interesting because if you've watched Jerome Powell's reports when he, you know, talks to the public, to the press about, you know, their forecast for, for rates and, and all that good stuff, a couple of, of meetings ago, Powell said that he does not expect inflation to get down, back to 2% by around 20, end of 2025. So this is interesting that Vanguard is saying, no, you're going to get there next year. So something to take a look at. And then for the monetary policy, this is what caught my eye the most. Now, this like this is the headline. This is like the really the most interesting part of this video or this report is what they're projecting when it comes to monetary policy because there's a huge disconnect. What we saw in the December meeting, the middle of December where Fed Powell hinted towards a three quarter basis point cut next year. The market, as you know, skyrocketed at the end of 20, uh, the end of last year in December. There's a disconnect between what Powell is saying and what the market is projecting and what Vanguard is projecting. One of them is going to be wrong. Either Powell is bluffing, which he hasn't been this far, this far, and there's a recession across the corner that he's not really telling us about that he sees, or the market is wrong. What what's wrong? The market's either wrong or the Fed's wrong. I don't know. You be the judge of that. But what Vanguard is saying here with the, their forecast is that the Fed is going to cut one and a half to two percent next year, two and three times more than what they forecasted at their last meeting here in December. So that's really interesting. This is, I think, the thing that you're going to want to watch out for here in 2024. Who's who's right? Is the, is the Fed right with what they're forecasting or are they bluffing or is the market right or are they wrong? So this is what you want to keep your eye on if you're an investor. This is especially important if you're maybe a potential home buyer. You're looking to invest into real estate or, you know, if you're invested in the stock market because this all has implications towards whether it be short or long-term duration assets. And so this was the, the highlight of the report for me is their forecast. So if you're thinking about selling a house and you're thinking you want the market to go back up, well, this might be your, your sign that real estate asset prices are gonna skyrocket if rates drop that much. Now, if you're thinking about buying a house, that might scare the crap out of you because you're like, well, no, I wanna buy a house, but I want the valuation, I want the prices to be lower. If, if rates get cut by one and a half, two percent, housing prices are going to skyrocket. So, but uh, I don't have a crystal ball. That's just how math works and how the market works. Or at least that's how it's been doing, you know, as of late. So we'll see. All right, now let's move on and let's take a look at the global outlook and summary. I'm just going to highlight a few things here. Vanguard is saying that higher interest rates are here to stay and that they believe that a higher interest rate environment will serve long-term investors well, but the transition may be bumpy. So what this means is you're still going to get your, your market average returns in the stock market, but it's going to be a bumpy ride, meaning more volatility. There's going to be a lot of friction in the market as long as interest rates remain elevated the way that they are. And they are high, even if they go down to three, you know, monetary policy rates go down to the Fed's fund rate goes down to three and a half to four percent. That's still historically very high compared to where we were at, you know, after the great financial crisis, as a simple example. Um, and then here, you know, looking at a soft landing in which inflation returns to target without a recession remains possible, as does a recession that is further delayed. And I think that's what, you know, if you watch CNBC or any, you know, market commentary, it's it's kind of weird. Like, I remember listening back in 2020, okay, there was going to be a recession in 2021. 
Well, that didn't happen. There's going to be a recession in 2022. Well, it technically happened, but then the current administration redefined what a recession was. And so that was kind of weird and funny at the same time. But whatever, that that happened. So then 2023 came along. No recession, but there was promise to recession. I, I don't know. At this point, I kind of feel like all these market commentaries are like the boy that who called cried wolf. Like they're all crying wolf. And once everybody stops crying wolf, I think that's when the recession is going to come. And when we least expect it, when there's, you know, so when all the noise goes away, when we least expect it. I don't know. It just sounds fishy. Anyways, a return to sound money for well diversified investors. The performance of high real interest rates provides a solid foundation for long-term risk adjusted returns. However, because the transition of higher rates is not yet complete, near-term financial market volatility is likely to remain elevated. Though the VIX and you know volatility has been pretty low lately, they're saying that volatility is still going to remain high. And when we look at bonds are back, our bond return, now this is really interesting. Most of you watching my channel don't invest in the bonds. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see how they view this. So they're actually forecasting over the next 10 years the different return expected returns. So this is interesting. Our bond return expectations have increased substantially. We now expect U.S. bonds to return a normal annualized 4.8 to 5.8 over the next decade compared with the 1.5 to 2.5 we expected before the rate hiking, hiking cycle began. Do you understand that? That is huge, especially if you're in a 60-40 portfolio or you invest in bonds. Maybe you're retired and you have asset allocation to, you know, into bonds. This is a really, really, this is really good news for you. Similarly, for international bonds, we expect annualized returns of 4.7 to 5.7 over the next decade compared with a forecast of 1.3 to 2.3 with when policy rates were low or in some cases negative. So do you understand in just a short period of time, the entire game, the entire script got flipped upside down. Now bonds are back. That's the headline. And it's, you're seeing that these, you're going to get equity like returns over the next 10, 10 years by investing into lower volatility assets like bonds. And that's what I was hinting towards at the beginning of the, the report here, that you're going to get similar returns you know, investing into bonds as you would with equities without the volatility. So if you're an income investor or you're maybe a little bit older, you're you're no longer working and you have more money sitting on the sidelines, bonds may be, you know, an asset class to consider. Moving on here, similarly, the case for the 60-40 portfolio has strengthened. For long-term investors in balanced portfolios, the probability of achieving a 10-year annualized return of at least 7% since 1990, on average, has risen from 8% in 2021 to 40% today. So let me summarize that so all, all of us peasants who don't read financial statements and everything can understand this. Before 2020, in 2021, your expected returns with the 60-40 being 60% equity, 40% bonds, your expected return was about, you know, you could expect around a 7% return. Now with bonds, interest, you know, with interest rates being so high, the expected return of at least 7% is over 40%. The probability has dramatically increased. So it, it also kind of comes in, it's pretty obvious, right? Like the timing of when you buy something, if something is, is at a lower price, you're going, to, you're going to be able to participate in the growth of that asset um, because you're getting in at a lower price. Okay, so it's just really, really interesting that, you know, in just a short handful of years, the game has completely changed and the bonds are back. Higher rates leave equities overvalued. Now, this is really interesting. If you invest in the stock market, it's important to kind of have a reasonable expectations on what you can expect in the stock market. And they're going to look at international versus U.S., so let's take a look at this. So valuations are most stretched in the U.S., meaning they're very pricey. As a result, we have downgraded our U.S. equity return expectations to an annualized 4.2 to 6.2% over the next 10 years 
you know, last year, you know, the stock market went up over 20%. So what does this mean? If they're right, that means there's going to be a reversion to mean to the mean. That means you're going to have lower, low, lower, low yield up. Uh, that means you're going to have lower lows in the coming years if if they're right. OK, um, and they're they're lowering that to a 4.2 to 6.2 from a 4.4 to 6.4. That's not that crazy. Within the U.S. market, value stocks are more attractive than they have been since late 2021. And small cap stocks also appear attractive for the long term. I've been hearing this quite a bit actually over the last couple of months. And if you watch my last video on inflows into ETFs, you might have noticed that I said that I saw a lot of inflows in the international. Well, I guess this transition already happened or has already started end of last year. So this transition into small cap in international has already taken place. If you take a look at the Russell 2000, for example, you're going to see that in December alone, I think it went up like 20%. So this transition is already happening. U.S. equities have continued to outperform their international peers. The key driver of this performance gap over the last two years have been valuation expansion and the U.S. dollar strength beyond our fair value estimates, both of which are likely to reverse. Projections suggest an increasing likelihood of greater opportunities outside the U.S. from a U.S. dollar investor's perspective. We project 10-year annualized returns of 7 to 9% for non-US developed markets and 6.8 to 8.6 for emerging markets. So they said this similar, you know, something similar last year in their report that international was going to outperform. And you're seeing that they're saying that again. They're re reiterating that once again that international due to valuations and the dollar that international and value and, and small stock, international value and small cap is where you're going to see more potential projected future returns. So moving on with their economic outlook, you can see here that the rate cuts in 2024, that there's going to be rate cuts in 2024, but zero rates are well behind us. And I think most people can agree with that unless we see a major event take place, I don't think you're going to see zero interest rates. I mean, at least anytime soon. It would take a you know, catastrophic event to, you know, force the hand of the Fed to cut rates to zero again. And in that case, you likely don't want that to happen, right? Like what happened during the great financial crisis? It was a crisis. What happened during the pandemic? It was a crisis. And it wasn't a crisis for everyone, but it was a crisis. And so in, in a best case scenario for, you know, return to normalcy, having interest rates at a reasonable rate is not a bad thing. And you're seeing here that many regions across the world here are expected to lower rates here in the coming year and years. All right, let's take a look at the implications of, re of the uh, return to sound money here. So Vanguard anticipates that rates over the next decade will be higher on average than they were the last decade. This is the single most important financial development since the 2008 global financial crisis, and it has profound implications on households, businesses, and governments. Now you have to remember households, you and I, this impacts us. Can we buy real estate? Can we buy toys, right? Like cars, jet skis, all of that stuff. Businesses, can they expand into new markets? Can they hire new people? And governments, can, what can the governments do? Can they invest into roads and you know programs? This impacts everything. So when looking at this graph here on the right, higher interest rates will exert pressure on debt sustainability. And you'll see here that they're projecting, this is this is actually really scary, everybody. Um, so when you look at this, this is the jet to GDP, uh, GDP price here in the US. You'll notice, you know, before the financial crisis of 08, 09, GDP was right under, you know, 50, you know, 50%. And now it's skyrocketed to almost 100% to our GD, you know, to GDP. So if lower interest in a lower interest rate environment, that means that this debt to GDP is going to be at a lower percentage. However, with higher interest rates, that means our debt to GDP is only going to skyrocket and only going to balloon into something more and more severe. So this is something that you want to take a look at that, you know, this is a new phenomenon over the last, you know, eight years or so that, the governments that we've had in office are just spending more and more money and it's getting out of control and something has to break. 
We can't, unless we can grow ourselves out of this through automation and productivity, I don't see another way other than cuts or, or something dramatic happening, a shock to the market or a shock to the system. This is something you want to take a look at. I'm not a fan of Bitcoin, but I can understand looking at this, I can see why people invest, invest in the Bitcoin because people are losing trust in our government and the system. Now, I'm not trying to fear monger or anything like that. But when you look at this and you open your eyes, it's like, what the heck is going on? What are, what what are they, they thinking? So, what are so, they keep doing? so Vanguard's market outlook here, they're saying that stretched U.S. equity valuations are apt to ease, that they're likely going to revert back to their historical mean. In 2023, however, valuations again have increased and the prospect that the higher interest rate environment will last for, year, for years remains unappreciated. So it's saying that the market is not appreciating that higher interest rates are going to have a massive impact on valuations, but the stock market is disconnected from reality is what they're hinting towards here. So U.S. equity prices exceed fair value. Looking ahead, we believe that the Federal Reserve and other central banks will win the fight against inflation. We expect short and long-term interest rates to recede from their peaks, but settle at higher levels than what we've become accustomed to, at least over the last you know couple decades. As a result, our estimates of equities' fair value will increase, but only modestly. We do not envision any near-term return to the high levels reached at the start of this decade. Interesting. Okay. So then moving back up here, the U.S. equity valuations need to fall to return to their fair value. So this is the fair value projection. This is the CAPE model, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio CAPE. And they're saying here that based off of this model, we are actually overvalued um, based off of this model and that we should correct, you know, back to the mean. Okay, well, what does that mean here? So the components of our forecast of equities returning to, you know, their total returns, this is what they're, they're forecasting. This kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier with the 10-year projection. This is a 10-year projection. They're saying that U.S. equities over the next 10 years will only have a five annual return and that global, you know, ex-U.S., so co countries outside of the United States will have a return of 8.1%, 8 8 so meaning the international will outperform the U.S. over the next 10 years. Now, this is just a projection. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to happen. A lot of this has to do with the U.S. dollar and how equities are valued here in the United States. And that valuation changes up, can change on a dime. So if you peel back the layers here and trying to understand, the S&P 500, for example, last year in 2023, averaged, I think it was over 20, 23 or 25%, over 20%. Now, 20% is significantly higher than 5%. And over a 10 year time period, you know, you may have years of underperformance and overperformance. But what they're saying here, if you look back 10 years into the future, if you were to go 10 years in the future and look back, the average return they're projecting would equal out about 5% each year. So that's what they're saying with these projections for the US versus, you know, ex US. Next, when talking about the U.S. dollar, Vanguard believes that the U.S. dollar faces more headwinds than tailwinds in the coming decade. The result should be some dollar depreciation and a boost to non-U.S. equity returns for dollar-based investors. The U.S. dollar is stronger than, fun than fundamentals warrant. Okay, and you'll see here in this graph that, you know, kind of looking at the, uh, the historical trend of the U.S. dollar, we've we peaked up. And so I'm not to say that the past will necessarily repeat itself, but, you know, history does rhyme. And so if you look back here in the early 2000s, when the U.S. dollar was overvalued based off of fundamentals, that there was a reversion down to the mean. And as you can see, this historical trend line or, or this historical range or fair value range, it doesn't always follow in that, but it kind of tracks that range. And so it's something to be mindful of that the U.S. dollar, it, it may face some headwinds in, you know, over the next 10 years. And so they're saying that thanks to higher interest rates, bonds are back. We've heard that a few times here in this article. With rising rates, it means that higher returns for long-term investors who are invested into bonds or have you know, more of a 60-40 portfolio allocation. And you'll see here the projected returns, You know, and we saw this earlier, if you were investing into bonds in 2021, your projected future returns were like 2%, I think is what it was, 
right around there. And now if you're investing into bonds now, your projected future returns over the next 10 years goes up to like four to five and a half percent. So they've skyrocketed based off of the valuation, right? So this is what's really interesting. If you're a net buyer of bonds, this may be a really good opportunity you know, compared to a few years ago when your expected returns were significantly lower, like one or 2% in bonds annualized. So bonds are back. The last thing that I wanna end with here is what I was mentioning earlier with the expected return um, of equities and bonds being fairly similar, but the volatility is what you're, you're gonna wanna focus on. You're gonna get about the same performance in both asset classes if you equally weighted them as an example, but the volatility is key here. So Vanguard is saying here that a more attractive risk return trade-off means our asset allocation favors bonds. The benchmark is 60-40. The benchmark is here on the top where 60% of your portfolio is in equities split up between US and international, and 40% is split up into bonds between US and international bonds. This is the benchmark, this is traditional. They're saying that an attractive risk return trade-off when is it's more favorable over the next 10 years to actually flip that, that you're having more allocated into fixed income or bonds and less allocated into equities. So if we visualize this here in a table here, you'll see that the benchmark is the traditional 60-40 portfolio. The 10-year expected annualized return is 6.4%. The 10-year expected annualized volatility is 9.8%. Okay, this is what I wanna focus on. Now, the uh, the time varying al asset allocation, this is what they're saying here where you're flipping it, where you have more, in, more into bonds and less into equities. They're saying that you're gonna have the same expected annualized rate of return over the next 10 years with less volatility. So they're arguing, or Vanguard is arguing here over the next 10 years, it would be more advantageous for investors on a risk adjusted base, return basis to invest higher into bonds, less into equities, and you'll get the same projected return with less volatility. So that's the major takeaway from this report based off of what's changed, that bonds are back, that rates do have a massive impact on projected future returns and valuations. And this is what, uh, what Vanguard is saying to look at here over the next decade. Because Vanguard, they, they give the projection for the next year, but they really, the majority of their research is focused on a 10-year time horizon. So what investors should expect over a 10-year time horizon, okay? And, and that being annualized. So now I wanna share my opinion on investing in a 2024, share some of the things that we've you know learned here from Vanguard, as well as kind of my initial thoughts as a long-term dividend investor. So the first major takeaway that I have from this is that valuations matter. You saw that with the bonds, you saw that with future projected returns. If you're investing at the peak of the market, it's gonna be very difficult as an investor to participate in the future growth of that asset. That is why value investing is so, so important and not just momentum investing, is that you're buying into an asset at a fair valuation. That's the first major takeaway. The second takeaway is that small caps are probably where most investors are going to be able to see the most value. Though there's, we've already seen a massive surge in, in uh, net inflows into these you know, small cap investments, ETFs and stocks. So a lot of them, it may already be too late to take advantage of, of that. Like the gold rush is already kind of over. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so, so be it. International falls into a similar bucket with small caps. The international compared to US equities, there seems to be a lot more value in those areas of the market. So those are the three major takeaways. Focus on valuations, valuations matter. Small caps are where you can, investors can see value today as well as international. So how could a normal retail investor like you and I take advantage of what we've learned and what, would, what does this mean? So I've seen dozens of comments over the last couple of months on my channel alone saying, Jake, why are you not investing into bonds? You know, why aren't you investing, why don't you have money in a high yield savings account? You're getting a higher return than SEHD. Well, yes, that's absolutely true, but it's important to understand and know your time horizon, okay? And understand that the market works in cycles. If you have a long-term time horizon, in my opinion, it is much 
smarter and better in almost every case to stay the course and stay invested in your long-term goals and not try to time the market. Are you telling me that you're going to be able to time the market perfectly and beat Wall Street and switch out of your savings account and transfer everything out of your bonds into equities before they go up? Are you saying that? So that's important that you understand that you know, timing, if you're trying to time the market, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And in my opinion, if you have a long-term time horizon, don't try to play the game. Invest into quality, invest into your preferred methodology, and don't try to time the market. The counter argument to this is if you do know that you're going to need the money in the next one to three years, let's say you're going to buy a house or something, a large purchase, it finally makes sense to park your money in a high yield savings account or short term treasuries where you're going to get a real return. And in this case, it makes a lot more sense to invest into that than going, you know, playing with the stock market. So, yes, if you have a short term time horizon and you need the money, now is a great time to take advantage of real returns in a savings account or in a treasury. The next thing here is I personally see a lot of value in high quality dividend stocks and dividend ETFs right now. The key is to focus on quality and companies that are growing their earnings per share. Also, a thing that I like to look at is companies with a low debt to free cash flow. Are they able to service their debt? Is, is their funds from operation or, you know, or their ca free cash flow, are they outpacing their debt maturities? And are they still able to grow and return value to shareholders in the form of a growing dividend? So it's something very, very important to look at, as well as, you know, looking at companies that are trading at fair, you know, price to earnings ratios. That's an easy way to see if a company is overvalued. Um, and so it's those are some things that I like to take a look at. So focus on quality. We saw the example, this extreme example of bonds. If you invested into bonds in 2021, you're not going to participate over the next decade in the growth of bonds. However, if you invested into bonds in 2023, for example, you're going to participate in the future growth of bonds. So timing does play a role, especially if you're lump sum investing. If you're dollar cost averaging like the majority of us, you can't necessarily do that. So you want to focus on what you can control, and that is by automating your investments as an example. So you wanna focus on what you can control. And then lastly here, you know, as we learned from the beginning of this video when, when I did the recap, market analysts don't always get things right. Vanguard missed on many fronts here from last year. I don't know if that's gonna continue here in 2024, if they're gonna get things right or wrong. And so when it comes to projecting what will happen in 2024, just try to inform yourself on what's going on in the market and think in decades and automate your investing using, using a methodology that fits your goals. In my opinion, if you want to retire early off of your dividend portfolio like I did in 2023, the best approach that I know is the simple path to wealth with dividend investing using this, the core and satellite approach. If you'd like to learn more about that, and if you're hearing that for the very first time, I talk a lot about that on my channel. I've made an entire video on the simple path to wealth with dividend investing which was inspired by JL Collins. I'll have that video pop up at the end of this video and you can watch that video next. Thank you so much for watching everybody and I hope everyone has had a great happy new year. Please subscribe, subscribe. Subscribe, subscribe. Please sub, sub, subscribe. You know what? I think we're gonna be friends. Can everyone say hi to my friend? That's crazy. I just wanted to say thanks. I'm glad you came along, partner.